It is a great honor for me to be here today among friends in this beautiful land of Romania. To me, it's a bit of heaven to be here among people who love the truth. Thank you all for coming. Today, I'm going to address the Flat Earth journey. This is especially meant for the open-minded skeptics who honestly believe that we live on a ball, flying, twirling, and vortexing through the vacuum of space. I was once like you. I believed in the globe and the heliocentric model. I never wanted to be a flat earther. But, like many others here, I'm willing to accept even an unpopular truth, regardless of the consequences. And I will spread that truth to the best of my ability. I have never made a penny on the flat earth. I don't have anything to sell to you. I don't want your donations. I don't monetize my YouTube channel. And I don't particularly care if you subscribe. I am not here for fame. I don't want you to join any group or appoint any leader. Other than maybe your friendship, I want nothing from you. I am only here to share what I strongly believe is the truth. And the truth is that the earth is flat and stationary. Initially, it's a frightening truth, as it rocks the very foundations of your understanding of how the world works, and maybe more importantly, how much you are controlled. For me, Flat Earth is the catalyst to break the chains that mentally, spiritually, physically, and scientifically bind humanity, and that's why it is so important to me and why I traveled here to discuss the Flat Earth reality with you. Are we flat earthers, illiterate flunkies who dropped out of kindergarten? Or maybe you think we're a group of religious zealots who deny anything associated with science. That's how the media repeatedly describes us, but they are deceiving you. Personally, I graduated from college, magna cum laude. I even have a master's and a juris doctorate. Yes, I took astronomy in college and I got an A. I know the official globe narrative pretty well, and there are many others like me. Because of those many years of indoctrination, it took me hundreds of hours of arduous research and experimentation before I would accept the flat earth truth. It did not come easy. I studied every possible globe objection very well, but as I will try to show you today, the flat earth evidence is overwhelming and far outweighs the evidence of the globe which is based primarily on conformity and name-calling. We get it. It's psychologically hard to force yourself to honestly investigate the flat earth. But it is the truth. It's beautiful. And it changes everything. Here is an axiom. Governments lie. If you have any common sense, you know that governments do indeed lie. And often but maybe you reasonably think the flat earth lie is too big. That is a valid objection and something I want to address. I mean, how could so many people be in on this conspiracy? The answer is what I call institutionalized conformity. Like many here, my flat earth journey started somewhere else. We could talk about the lies of central banking, the Rothschilds and other banking dynasties, the lies of World War I and II, the CFR and the Trilateral Commission, vaccinations. We could even talk about Sandy Hook and the Boston bombing. They'd probably throw me in prison for that, and we don't have all day. So for time constraints, let's begin with Vietnam and the Gulf of Tonkin. Not many people have heard of the Gulf of Tonkin incident, even though the United States Congress declared war on North Vietnam after the claimed unprovoked August 4, 1964 naval attacks in international waters against America by North Vietnam. After the supposed August 4th attacks by North Vietnam, the United States Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which granted President Lyndon Johnson the authority to assist any Southeast Asian country whose government was considered to be jeopardized by communist aggression, thus bringing America into the Vietnam War. LBJ recognized the importance of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution when he quipped that the resolution was like Grandma's nightshirt. It covers everything. A few days after the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was passed, President Johnson stated, Hell, those damn stupid sailors were just shooting at flying fish. As the president alluded, the August 4th, 1964 attacks never happened. It was fake. Phony. It was artifice. 
and all investigations have indicated the same. The Gulf of Tonkin incident is now an admitted hoax perpetrated by the U.S. government. Humanity was lied to and America went to war under deliberate false pretense. And there's nothing funny about that. A major catastrophic evil war was fought as a result of this fabricated event. Hundreds of thousands of people died as a consequence of this conspiracy. But here's my question to you. How many people were punished as a result of this admitted heinous lie that led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands? Zero. I would think wide-scale murder and treason would be of some concern to our enforcement agencies, but it doesn't seem like they cared. So, we have a huge whopping lie that led to hundreds of thousands of deaths that is whitewashed by our governments, our media, academia, and our police enforcement agencies. Are big lies possible? Gulf of Tonkin says yes. Let's talk about Operation Northwoods. Operation Northwoods was an admitted Department of Defense 1962 memorandum that called for the CIA or other U.S. government operatives to commit acts of terrorism against American civilians and military targets, blaming them on the Cuban government and using it to justify a war against Cuba. Damn, that sounds familiar. The plans detailed in the document include the possible assassination of Cuban emigres, sinking boats of Cuban refugees on the high seas, hijacking planes, blowing up a U.S. ship, and orchestrating violent terrorism in U.S. cities. The treasonous U.S. Department of Defense was openly proposing to commit acts of terrorism against American civilians in U.S. cities. It was the proposed murder of Americans so that America would go to war to murder others. Fortunately, these proposals were allegedly rejected by John F. Kennedy. I'm not so sure if that helped Kennedy's career, though. Are big conspiracies possible? The Department of Defense thought so. Which brings us to 9-11. Regardless of whether the United States committed this horrific act of terrorism against its citizens directly, or whether the U.S. government was just an accessory in the commission of, or after the fact, Building 7 is the smoking gun proof of this huge conspiracy, as Building 7 was not allegedly hit by an airplane, and yet it collapsed symmetrically and at free fall speeds. I'm sorry, but office fires cannot collapse a steel-constructed building symmetrically and at free fall speeds. It is nonsense. More than 3,000 licensed architects and engineers have said the same, and the numbers keep growing. Even a group of academic engineers in Alaska recently reached the same conclusion, but you didn't hear about that on the news. Interestingly, just a few weeks ago, CNBC senior analyst and former anchor Ron Insana openly stated that Building 7 was brought down by controlled demolition. Again, you probably didn't hear about that. Why were there no mainstream discussions of Building 7, an obvious demolition that would have had to have been wired to explode long before September 11th? Why didn't you hear about this gentleman, Barry Jennings, who is now dead? He actually worked for the government in Building 7, Jennings was a very credible witness. He was the deputy director of the Emergency Services Department for the New York City Housing Authority, and he worked in Building 7 on 9-11. He described an abandoned building and then explosions in the lower levels of Building 7 before any of the other two towers came down. I don't want to make this a conference about 9-11, but 9-11 proves to any sensible, truth-seeking person that we have been lied to on a massive scale. And our governments, media, academia, military police forces, and major institutions aren't there to provide the truth or to punish those evildoers. Instead, these institutions are there to only control the narrative and make sure we the people do not get out of hand. Please go to AE 911 Truth to learn more. One other thing 9-11 indicates is that the evil cabal, 
that controls things has hired hundreds of propagandists, publications, so-called experts, media darlings, and their agents who do nothing but belittle truth seekers, lie, and promote the official narrative. These despicable sellouts are the scum of the earth, and they are everywhere. Unlike Big Brother in the book 1984, our Ministry of Truth uses a conglomeration of governments, institutions, schools, media, companies, religions, and their agents to control us from every direction while operating under the grand illusion of separation. There are no checks and balances. Are big lies possible? 9-11 unequivocally says yes. I'm going to speak about the phony NASA moon landings tomorrow, but one thing you should note is that every government and all of our media outlets and other institutions claim that these wire-dangling astronauts landed on the moon 50 years ago. These liars supposedly fell at 4,000 miles per hour in this piece of junk that was never flown even once on Earth. They then later attached a fold-up dune buggy and lived three days in this untested papier-mâché craft in the harshest environment imaginable. They want you to believe that NASA operated this camera 234,000 miles away while it panned and zoomed out in real time while filming this ridiculous contraption that's obviously missing the thrust from the end of the nozzle. You can even see telltale signs of 1960s movie backdrops during all of the alleged landings. Are big conspiracies possible? Yes, without question, the phony moon landings, 9-11, and Gulf of Tonkin prove that these bastards can lie to us big time and that none of our major institutions are there to help us expose them or hold them accountable. These evil people have lied to us repeatedly, so why would you trust them? The truth is left to us. You, me, and the grassroots community. Which brings us to the Flat Earth. In every nation and in every city, schools consider the shape of the Earth a fundamental scientific fact, and that supposed fact is repeatedly taught from day one all the way through graduate school. Yet no one has seen this globe or its curvature or its effects, but it's still taught as a fundamental fact based solely on faith in our institutions. Much like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, the globe is truly a faith-based religious system with the Big Bang, gravity, and nature as our creators. In addition to incessant educational programming, the spherical Earth is shown in countless movies, television shows, video games, books, comics, newspapers, businesses, and websites. Pay attention. They put the sphere and the alleged curvature in nearly everything in the media. It is no exaggeration that every day there's a news story, new movie, picture, or show regarding so-called space supporting your understanding of the globe, earth, and outer space. The globe indoctrination is ubiquitous and unrelenting. Moreover, the spherical earth is fully supported by every major religion, Catholics, Protestants, Mormons, Muslims, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, all major religions support the spherical earth. There is no other symbol that is shown with as much pride and zeal than the globe earth. Moreover, the term flat earther is a well-known pejorative term to refer to someone as anti-science or anti-facts. If you ever want to ruin your reputation among a group of people, just refer to yourself as a flat earther, and the mocking will begin by even your closest loved ones. I guarantee that every flat earther here knows this as a personal fact. Ask yourself, why does questioning the globe earth cause such a knee-jerk, negative emotional response? Like Pavlov's dogs, when you mention the flat earth to anyone, almost without exception, the listener will be enraged, salivating at the mere mention of it. We get it, but please, try to set aside that Pavlovian response and just allow yourself to have a legitimate discussion with us, even out of intellectual curiosity. So what has caused we flat earthers, who probably number in the millions now, to abandon our educational foundations, all mainstream science, every major religion, and all of our news, entertainment, and media to support an idea that is even used as a slanderous term to refer to someone as an idiot? In a nutshell, 
flat earth is about hundreds, if not thousands, of grassroots tests, experiments, and observations that consistently belie the GLOBE model. New experiments, tests, and observations are coming out every day from every nation, unequivocally indicating that the GLOBE is false and we truly do live on a flat and stationary earth. There is no faith involved. It's a testable fact. But I'm going to show you right now who is to blame for the Flat Earth Revolution. Here are the three primary culprits. The Curvature Formula, the Nikon P900, and YouTube. Those three things changed my life forever, and it shocked me to my core. Culprit 1, the Curvature Formula. Back in 1838, Samuel Robotham tested the purported Earth's curvature with a telescope standing 8 inches above the water while he watched a boat remain visible for a distance of 6 miles, which should have been impossible under the official globe dimensions. In fact, the boat should have been mathematically hidden 16 feet below the horizon, but it wasn't. Robotham's book, Zetetic Astronomy, is a must-read, where he includes many other tests as well. In Zetetic Astronomy, Robotham introduced the world to the curvature formula. Now, I understand Romania uses the metric system, however, I'll be using mostly the imperial system for simplicity, so please bear with me. I want everyone in the audience to please show me by raising your hands how many of you know the answer to this question. Eight inches per? Please, everyone say it with me. Eight inches per mile squared. How did an entire audience know this mathematical expression? Eight inches per mile squared represents how much a distant object should be hidden below the horizon from a ground level view based on the official mathematical dimensions of the Earth. That is a ball Earth with a circumference of 24,901 miles. The curvature formula is a mathematical certainty for all observable distances with respect to the imaginary globe Earth. Rollbotham stated the curvature drop formula very well. If the Earth is a globe and is 25,000 English statute miles in circumference, the surface of all standing water must have a certain degree of convexity. Every part must be an arc of a circle. From the summit of any such arc, there will exist a curvature or declination of 8 inches in the first statute mile. In the second mile, the fall will be 32 inches. In the third mile, 72 inches or 6 feet, as shown in the following diagram. So, at one mile, a distant object should drop eight inches. Not a big deal. But let's look at four miles. Remember, eight inches per mile squared, you square the miles. Four miles times four miles times eight inches divided by 12 equals 10.6 feet. A curvature drop of 10.6 feet at just four miles. Now, wait a second. We could take binoculars out and easily see four miles on a clear day. What about a distance of 8 miles? 8 miles times 8 miles times 8 inches divided by 12 equals 43 feet or 13.1 meters. Now, I bet there are a few people here who have stood at the edge of a lake on a clear day with binoculars and could see the shore on the other side 8 miles away. But there should have been roughly a drop of 43 feet. Let's be clear, there is an adjustment for observation height, but even at an observation height of 6 feet above the water and a distance of 8 miles, 17 feet should be hidden by the curvature of the Earth, and yet you can see people walking on the beach at the opposite shore. I have an older friend of mine who grew up in a house right next to Utah Lake. He immediately knew there was a problem when presented with the fact about 8 inches per mile squared because for throughout his life, when visibility was high, he would take binoculars out and could see the other shore 10 miles away. So, how much drop should there be at 10 miles or 16.1 kilometers? 10 times 10 times 8 inches divided by 12 equals 67 feet or 20.4 meters. This is a 67-foot statue. Does anyone here think they've seen this much curvature drop at 10 miles? This entire statue would be hidden behind the curvature of the Earth at only 10 miles away. No one has seen this curvature, and the Flat Earth video evidence is overwhelming. What about 20 miles? 266 foot drop. 50 miles. 1,666 foot drop. 100 miles. 6,667 foot drop. 
As you can see, at 100 miles distance, the curvature drop is so substantial that it would hide a 6,667 foot tall mountain like this one here, Mount Drum in Alaska. The prominence of this mountain is 6,710 feet. Very close. How many people have witnessed a drop this tall while driving 100 miles along a coastal road? You can see 100 miles with a high zoom camera. No one has witnessed this curvature. The Suez Canal, as shown in this video, is 120 miles long. Under your official globe model, that's a curvature drop of 9,600 feet or 2,926 meters. That's about the prominence of Mount Shasta, shown here. Do you see a curvature drop of 9,600 feet along the Suez Canal in this video that could hide Mount Shasta? I don't. Another important question is, why haven't you ever heard about the very fun fact that the Earth supposedly drops at 8 inches per mile squared? Everyone's heard of E equals MC squared, and no one can apply that to reality. But up until just a few years ago, no one ever heard of the Earth's supposed curvature drop of 8 inches per mile squared, even though every person should see this on a daily basis. Imagine how fun that would be in a classroom to demonstrate the shape of the Earth by measuring the supposed curvature drop of a city that's 30 miles away by using a simple math that a 10-year-old would comprehend. But no one was ever taught this in a classroom, not even in surveying courses. Why? The 8 inches per mile squared formula is very accurate over all visible distances. Let me reiterate. 8 inches per mile squared isn't some math we flat earthers made up. These are the actual factual numbers based on the official dimensions of the earth, and you are welcome to do the math or plug the information into engineering software to verify it. I didn't believe it at first, and even Google used to falsely claim that it was only 8 inches per mile. I had to double check the math on AutoCAD just to be sure. It is a mathematical certainty that does not fit with actual repeated observations and tests. You do have to consider the height of the observer, and so you subtract the distance to the alleged globe horizon from your distance to the object. For example, I use a distance to the globe horizon calculator, like this one. So, if I'm on the beach observing at 6 feet height, the maximum horizon distance under the globe would only be 3 miles. If I'm looking at an object at 10 miles distance across the water while standing at the water's edge, I first subtract the 3 miles distance to the horizon to get 7 miles distance, and then I apply the 8 inches per mile squared formula. So 7 times 7 times 8 inches divided by 12 equals 33 feet. That means for an observer 6 feet tall at the water's edge, that object 10 miles away should be hidden behind 33 feet of curvature. That's huge. That's measurable and testable. Or you can simply input the information here on this calculator. It is very accurate over all observable distances, those distances under 500 miles. The globe model proof relies upon an implausible story about a well and a shadow in ancient Egypt that has varying interpretations. In contrast, flat earthers rely on actual, concrete measurements that anyone can make to measure the supposed curvature of the Earth if there was one. Here's an infamous example of the curvature problem. How many people here can quote this weatherman? What you're seeing here is a mirage. Why is he saying that? Because the entire city of Chicago should be hidden behind the curvature of the earth. Does that look like a mirage to you? Of course it's not. It's bullshit. Everyone here probably had warning bells go off when you heard that weatherman make that ridiculously false statement. That is no mirage, that is a direct line of sight that is often obstructed by haze, miraging, atmospheric distortion, weather, or larger, closer waves and swells that have a large respective angular size. The hired liars out there will use these obvious atmospheric distortions or large swells and waves as proofs of the curvature. Don't let the deceivers trick you, because they're going to try. Here's another one. In this clip, the news lady again says that you're seeing a mirage. It's a photograph from Michigan to Milwaukee at a distance of 80 miles. The top, the top of the tallest building in Milwaukee should be 3,102 feet below the horizon, according to the spherical model, but we can see much of the city line. Do you think that's line of sight, 
or selective curvature hopping mirages that just happen to present a flat Earth. Can you allow yourself to see the problem here? I don't care if you believe me right now, but you as a rational thinking individual need to grab your telescope and your binoculars and head out to the lake or ocean on a calm, high visibility day without miraging and you will see the flat earth for yourself. We see too far. There is no earth curvature at 8 inches per mile squared. That is a fact. That brings us to culprit two. What would have happened if Robotham in 1838, who was claiming that he could see too far, could have live-streamed his six-mile test on YouTube? Well, maybe things would have been different. The YouTube platform enabled hundreds, if not thousands, of us to conduct similar curvature and other tests, like Robotham. YouTube enabled us to share our observations with millions of people, and they could see it for themselves. Flat Earth is founded on repeatable observations and tests that anyone here can perform, and millions of people are seeing the truth despite the overwhelming propaganda and censorship that is now happening. Flat Earthers don't say, believe us. Flat Earthers say, believe no one. Test it for yourself. Because of the Flat Earth Revolution, YouTube has taken active steps to stop the Flat Earth on its website, as openly stated in Congress by the president of YouTube, as shown right here. Yes, the president of YouTube proclaimed that YouTube would suppress Flat Earth and promote the official story, and it's YouTube's official policy. And so it's hard to find genuine Flat Earth researchers anymore. YouTube is now actively banning and suppressing peace-loving people like me while simultaneously promoting the official globe narrative. But Google's censorship cannot undo what has been done. Humanity has discovered that there is indeed no curvature to the earth. And that truth will not be suppressed because you can see it for yourself with merely a telescope or high zoom camera. Even though it has become a bastion of censorship now, I still want to thank YouTube for its unwitting help and especially those first flat earth pioneer YouTubers like Eric DeBay, ODD Reality, Mark Sargent, Jaronism, Rob Skiba, DITRH, Mr. Thrive and Survive, My Perspective, P Brain, Globusters, the speakers here, and so many more. Thank you. Now we're to the third culprit for the Flat Earth Revolution. We already discussed the curvature chart, but now we're going to test its application, which brings us to the Nikon P900. They now have a Nikon P1000, but this P900 changed everything. Nikon made it easy and affordable to zoom in at 83 times magnification, record it, and then upload the video to YouTube and other video sharing sites. I thought flat earthers were maybe faking their tests, so I bought this camera so I could see it for myself. Flat earthers aren't faking anything. Unlike the globe model propagandists, you don't have to trust us. Flat earth isn't word of mouth anymore. I can show you the actual video proof again and again and again. Before I start discussing the proofs of the flat earth, it's necessary to first address the ridiculousness of the official heliocentric model, because you probably haven't really thought about it. I didn't. I just parroted information in my classrooms to get the grade. Shockingly, very few people even know what the official heliocentric model is. Let's just cover a few of the numbers. If you believe in official heliocentrism, you believe that the wobbling and tilted Earth is rotating 1,037 miles per hour at the equator. The speed of sound is 767 miles per hour, so the ground you're standing on, at least on the equator, is allegedly moving at 1.4 times the speed of sound. Can you think of any evidence of the Earth's rotation? Wouldn't you think that this movement would be evident in the atmosphere, that airplanes, clouds, and weather balloons would be affected by the ground's movement at 1,037 miles per hour? The fact is that there's no evidence of the ground's rotation whatsoever. Foucault pendulums and the supposed Earth's Coriolis effect are nonsense. They are absurd lies. Second, if you believe in heliocentrism, you believe that the Earth is moving in its orbit around the Sun at 66,600 miles per hour. Even Einstein said you can't detect the Earth's movement by any optical experiment. So why do you believe in this nonsense other than you just take it on faith? But it doesn't end there. 
Next, the official model says that the sun is also moving at approximately 450,000 miles per hour, and all the planets are somehow being dragged by the sun's gravity as the sun rockets through space around the Milky Way galaxy. With all these inconceivable and undetectable movements, the North Star has remained fixed, year after year, and has been that way throughout recorded history. Next, you believe the entire Milky Way galaxy, including our Sun and the North Star, is traveling at 1.34 million miles per hour towards the constellation Hydra. If you believe in heliocentrism, you believe the Earth is moving in a vortex through space like this at over a million miles per hour. Of course, this video isn't correctly scaled, but it's even more ridiculous when you think of it correctly scaled. But I want you to think about this. All of the so-called planets and their moons are all supposed to be on the same plane with the sun, but rocketing with the sun at unimaginable speeds being pulled by gravity. How would gravity hold these planets on the same plane as the sun? How surprised would you be at firing a bowling ball, representing our sun, and then have tiny BBs up to 3,000 feet away orbiting around the zooming bowling ball sun and still maintaining the same speed with the bowling ball? It's nonsense, especially when you consider that those tiny BBs have other tiny BBs rotating around them, all maintaining the same plane with our bowling ball sun. Think about comets that zip away from the sun to then, 70 years later, like Halley's Comet, to catch back up with the sun on a tabular schedule. Are these comets attached by rubber bands? How did they catch back up? I don't care how many degrees you have. This is stupid. Look at this footage of star trails. Think of how impossible it would be to film these trails as the Earth is supposedly wobbling, tilted, rotating at 1,000 miles per hour, orbiting at 66,600 miles per hour, and chasing after a sun zooming at 450,000 miles per hour. As pointed out in the book Kings Dethroned, modern astronomy is built upon shameful blunder after shameful blunder. It's fascinating how few honest, educated people have found these blunders but that's the power of institutionalized conformity. Even the most educated become nothing but mere parrots of their institutions. But let's get to some of the proofs of the flat earth. For those who have been watching my YouTube channel, some of these tests are repeats, so please be patient. This video is really meant for the skeptics. Exhibit one, reservoir 6.3 mile sun reflection test. What you're seeing right now is my first curvature test back in April 2016. I had been researching flat earth since October 2015, but this was the first time I tested it with my Nikon P900. I chose a distance of six miles because I wanted to test whether Robotham was telling the truth. He was. In this test, my wife was carrying a mirror at the opposite end of a reservoir, reflecting the sunlight from 6.3 miles away. I watched my wife place the mirror into the water. However, under the globe model, and that's taking the observation height into consideration, my wife should have been entirely obstructed by the curvature with a target hidden height over 12 feet. 12 feet should have been hidden by the alleged curvature, but there is simply no curvature over that her reservoir. I also want to quickly address the globe refraction argument. This is a still from the video. Here it is cropped and zoomed in. Here is a picture of what it looks like on the opposite shore, and you can see the strange branch that projects horizontally. If 12 feet should have been hidden behind the curvature, then my footage from 6.3 miles should have looked something like this. But the globe liars out there will claim that this 12-foot section hopped the curvature and is a mirage. But here's the problem with that. If this 12-foot section inexplicably hopped the curvature, then why didn't the rest of the view get distorted? There would be a cascading distortion effect. As you can see, there is no distortion accounting for this curvature hopping. Exhibit 2, Utah Lake 7.53 mile spotlight test. This was my next flat earth test at Utah Lake in May 2016. This time my wife was carrying a spotlight 7.53 miles away and I watched her place the spotlight right up to the water's edge. At 7.53 miles, my wife should have been entirely hidden by the curvature with a target hidden height of 21 feet. As you can see, the water is calm and flat. Obviously, this isn't a mirage. This is a direct line of sight to the other shore. In order to see this far, you need very calm water without miraging or atmospheric distortion. Be cautious. The liars out there will take pictures of distant mirages and call that the missing curvature. Exhibit 3, Utah Lake 7.53 mile frozen spotlight test. For this test, 
I reversed the previous Utah Lake test and I conducted this test in freezing conditions. Like the last time, my wife's spotlight should have been hidden 21 feet below the horizon. What's also important about this video is the fact that all the lights and the reflections are symmetrical. A globe supporter wants you to believe that the spotlight is selectively arcing over the curvature, which is absurd. But if that's the case, then how come all of these lights are symmetrical, like they're above a mirror? Which of these lights are mirages? Which ones are selectively jumping over the hump of curvature? You would not see this unmistakable mirror symmetry if the globe model refraction claim was correct. Furthermore, my wife carried the spotlight from 50 feet up to the water surface. When did she turn into a mirage? Notwithstanding the absurd objections, it is obvious that the lake is flat. Water seeks its own level. So long as viewing conditions are clear, the globe model fails again and again. But don't trust me. Go out and do these tests yourself. Exhibit 4. The Horizon Test. What is the horizon? Under the globe model, the horizon is a physical barrier caused by the alleged curvature. Under the globe, the horizon marks the point where the water or ground geometrically begins to obscure distant objects. This is the official position. As I mentioned earlier, you can use a calculator like this one to determine the distance to the alleged globe physical horizon. In contrast, the flat earth model says that the horizon is a matter of perspective. Artists get it. You'll see the same in a long corridor or in a tunnel. Just like how railroad tracks meet at the horizon, the ground and the sky similarly meet at the horizon. Do you think it's just coincidence that railroad tracks come together at the horizon? No, this is all a matter of perspective and has nothing to do with the physical curvature barrier. You can see this truth of perspective by just looking at the clouds at the horizon. You can see that the clouds follow perspective lines and are not bending around a curvature. In fact, you don't see any bending of clouds to match the curvature whatsoever. This is how sunsets work on a flat Earth. I have spent a lot of time and effort in testing the alleged globe horizon, and the globe model does not match reality whatsoever. For this horizon test, I was at the Great Salt Lake in Utah. I was observing a small piece of land at a distance of 1.34 miles. I brought the camera down to just a few inches above the water. Under the globe model, at just a few inches above the water, the horizon could not be further than 0.7 miles away. That's the maximum horizon distance under the globe model. There should not be any water visible beyond 0.7 miles, but you can clearly see the horizon extending many miles further than possible under the globe model. The naysayers will claim that this is a mirage or that the water is selectively refracting. Think about that. They're claiming that the bulge of water disappeared in front of the peninsula and then rose up miles beyond the peninsula but did not affect the peninsula with this magical act. The refraction excuse is nonsense and each observation I've shown you so far clearly proves that. Exhibit 5. BMLS B69 and the oil platforms. This video is from my friend BMLS B69 in California. For this video, he's at an elevation of 105 feet. There are three oil platforms he's filming. The closest one is at 10.9 miles, the second is at 21.9 miles, and the third is at 26.4 miles. From that elevation, the horizon line cannot be further than 12.6 miles. In other words, under the GLOW model, the horizon should appear before the second platform, and 59 feet of the second platform should be hidden by the curvature. As you can see with your own eyes, the horizon is not only beyond the second platform, the horizon is beyond the third platform, further than 26.4 miles. 130 feet of the third platform should have been hidden below the horizon, but none of the platform is obstructed. We know this since the horizon is beyond the third platform. Did the bulge of water selectively disappear from in front of the second platform and then reappear well beyond the third platform? And this disappearing and reappearing magic effect happened all without affecting the two platforms themselves? Are you skeptics starting to see the problem with the globe yet? What do you do when the evidence you can reasonably gather completely contradicts your indoctrinated presumptions? Will you allow yourself to question your indoctrination or will you hold fast to your comfortable conformity? I can show you many more of these horizon tests, all proving the globe model faults. Well, let's get to some of the laser tests. Exhibit 6, D-Marble's 10-mile laser test. This laser test was by D-Marble. 
In this case, the person holding the laser was at 7 feet, shooting the laser at a distance of 10 miles. At 10 miles under the globe model, the observer would have to be at a height of 30 feet in order to see the laser source. Instead, you can see the source of laser at just inches above the water. That water is flat, and the laser source proves that it is not being obscured behind the curvature. The liars have tried to confuse the issue by claiming that the laser wasn't level, but that's entirely irrelevant, since if the laser was angled downward, it would have hit the ledge curvature quicker. If the laser was pointed upward, then the observers would still not have seen the source, because the source of the laser would still have been hidden behind the alleged curvature. This footage would be impossible if we were living on a globe. Exhibit 7. Dr. John D's 9.5 mile laser test. Now, the following test was by Dr. John D, who has a PhD in spectrophotometry. Like many other tests he has conducted, Dr. John goes through painstaking detail to confirm that over a distance of 9.5 miles, there's absolutely no curvature. 39 feet should have been hidden. Dr. John repeatedly took sea and air temperatures, height, weather, humidity, and atmospheric readings. This is a legitimate scientist proving that we've been told a lie. Exhibit 8, FE Core 25 mile laser test. FE Core is an independent scientific foundation. You can read about FE Core's powerful laser test here. The laser test was over a distance of 25 miles. All atmospheric conditions and temperatures were taken, and there's nothing there that accounts for the fact that they were able to see the laser 25 miles away. 297 feet should have been hidden below the horizon. That's the height of a skyscraper. And FE Core filmed the laser at just 5 feet above the water. Exhibit 9. Salton C. 18 mile sun reflection and laser test. Out of all of the tests that I've seen, this is probably my favorite so far. A group of researchers went to the Salton Sea in California and tested the curvature with both a laser and a sunset mirror flash. These tests were huge because the test was at a distance of 18 miles and you can see it all on video with multiple witnesses. Again, that's 18 miles shore to shore. As you can see here, they were able to see and film the reflection of the mirror that was 18 miles away from the camera. 155 feet should have been hidden. 155 feet. This minaret in Uzbekistan is 150 feet tall. According to the globe model, you would have to be standing on this minaret to see the reflection of the sunlight 18 miles away like that. In addition to the sun reflection test, they also conducted a laser test. Here is the laser from 18 miles. You can even see the reflection of the laser on the flat water. Do you think it's possible that the source of the laser and its reflection both selectively hopped over the curvature to present a false flat earth? Exhibit 10, J. Tolan Media 1, Infrared Observations. J. Tolan Media 1 is a well-educated engineer who has been destroying the gold model with many infrared observations and other tests. Just look at these videos and photographs taken from an airplane at 30,000 feet. In some cases, he is viewing further than 500 miles with infrared, a complete impossibility under the globe model. All of his tests and observations are indicating a flat earth, and it's simply beautiful what God has given us. Exhibit 11, Beyond Horizons website. Beyond Horizons is an old flat earth website, but it is a repository of record-breaking long-distance photographs on the surface of the earth. There are dozens of globe-defined photographs on this website. Here's the record photograph of Peak Gaspard at a distance of 275 miles or 443 kilometers. With an observation height of 9,272 feet, the very top of Peak Gaspard at 12,730 feet should have been hidden 3,772 feet below the horizon. I literally could point to hundreds of these globe-defined photographs and videos. Based on the evidence, I think that any reasonable person watching this would understand that we see too far. And if you want more photographic and video evidence, go to my YouTube channel, Taboo Conspiracy 2, because this was just a sampling of the many proofs that we see too far. But let's move on to some of the other major proofs of the Flat Earth, because it doesn't end with just these optical and laser measurements. Exhibit 12, Airplanes and Gyroscopes. Now that we understand that the globe model requires that the Earth drop away at 8 inches per mile squared, shouldn't airplanes have to continually dip their noses to account for this drastic change? Think about a pilot who levels out and flies. 
the airplane at 500 miles per hour for just 10 minutes. That would require a correction of roughly 4,630 feet after just 10 minutes. Pilots would unquestionably know of this curvature correction, but it doesn't exist. Pilots don't have to dip their nose to correct for the curvature, regardless of the speed or altitude of the airplane. No pilot makes this adjustment. Pilots fly over a flat and stationary earth. Furthermore, the sensitive mechanical gyroscope in the airplane, which retains rigidity in space, indicates neither curvature nor rotation of the earth. Gyroscopes also prove a flat and stationary earth. Exhibit 13, Guglielmo Marconi. On December 12, 1901, Guglielmo Marconi received a radio transmission across the Atlantic Ocean at a distance of 2,135 miles. A lot of people told Marconi that it was impossible to send a radio signal that far due to the alleged curvature of the Earth. In fact, under the GLOBE model, those skeptics were right, as there would be a curvature drop of 527 miles over that distance. A drop of 527 miles is huge. Do you think that radio signals traveling at the speed of light can jump a curvature that size? The distances of radio transmissions have gotten much further since Marconi, again proving there is no curvature. Every time no curvature is proven through actual experimentation, mainstream science counters with imaginary new reasons why the Earth only appears to be flat. Due to Marconi, the ionosphere was imagined and created. Exhibit 14, Nicobine. Nicobine was a VHF, that's very high frequency radio targeting system used by German bombers in World War II. Nicobine was a line of sight targeting system. For this example, there were two beams, one from Stolberg, located 443 miles away from the target Derby, England. The second was from Cleve, 331 miles away from Derby. What's fascinating is that the leading government science advisor for Churchill, Frederick Lindemann, refused to believe that there was such a beam due to the curvature of the Earth. The advisor was right. There should have been a major problem with the curvature, as VHF beams do not allegedly wrap around the curvature. It turns out that the Nicobine system did exist, and people lost their lives because Lindemann believed in the curvature. But the fact remains that Nicobine was a line-of-sight targeting system. Accordingly, Wikipedia and other websites claim that the German bombers remained within line-of-sight of the two beams. What's the problem then? There absolutely should not have been a line of sight with the bombers. With hidden heights at approximately 64,844 feet and 117,504 feet, there was no way for these Nicobine systems to have line of sight with bombers that only flew at 19,200 feet. The Nicobine targeting system proved there was no curvature. Exhibit 15, Loran C. Loran C was a naval positioning system used for decades allegedly up to the 1990s. Essentially, it worked by two radio towers on the coast that would transmit radio waves across the ocean. The Loran system would use the difference in the timing of the radio signals to calculate the vessel's location. This system was highly accurate and is probably the same underlying application used today that is referred to as GPS. If you're looking at the map, you probably already see the problem. These stations, hundreds of miles apart, could be a thousand miles away from the vessel meaning these radio waves would have to have hopped a curvature up to 100 miles tall. The official explanation is that these radio waves traveling at the speed of light hug the surface of the Earth and wrap around the curvature, inexplicably jumping bulges of water and Earth dozens of miles tall. Does that sound believable to you? Wouldn't curvature hopping interfere with the location readings of the vessel? Like Marconi and Nicobine, Lorancy is another proof of the flat Earth. One more point about Loran C. Look at this coverage map. Where is Loran missing? Remember that Loran was developed for the military. Did no one think it important to have location guidance for the navies in the southern hemisphere? The fact that Loran was missing in the south indicates that there was a problem with distances for southern vessels, which makes complete sense when viewed under a flat earth map. The same applies for airplanes, which always lose their GPS signals in the oceans over the south again evincing a flat Earth. Exhibit 16, the non-rotating atmosphere. At the equator, the ground is allegedly rotating at 1,037 miles per hour. Yet Felix Baumgartner took a balloon up to 128,000 feet above the surface, and it took him two and a half hours to get that high. 
So if the ground is rotating at 1,037 miles per hour, then Felix Baumgartner should have landed in the Pacific Ocean. As you are aware, Felix didn't land in the Pacific Ocean. He actually landed 44 miles east of his launch site. That's against the supposed rotation and absolutely the wrong direction. Don't you think the rotation of the Earth should have affected Felix's jump? They want you to believe that as Felix rose up through the air, that the layers of the atmosphere continually sped up to keep up with the ground below. Does that make sense to you? I'm sorry, but the globe model is belied by fluid dynamics. Look at this volcanic plume. Although angled perpendicular to the surface, the volcanic plume is unaffected by any purported rotation of the ground below it. How could the upper layers of the plume keep up with the ground spinning at 1,000 miles per hour? It's asinine when you really think about it. From airplanes, to weather balloons, to hurricanes, to clouds in the sky, nothing is affected by any alleged rotation of the Earth. I really like this quote from physicist Dr. Carl Scheffer. But we know of no body, the parts of which have much less connection with each other than is the case with air. The air layer next to the Earth, really dragged along by the communicated motion, would not be able to communicate its motion to the layers above it, for the simple reason that it stands in no connection with them. These upper layers must therefore remain in their place, or which would signify the same thing, would apparently flow westward with the same rapidity with the which the Earth is said to rotate to the east. Now, since a point on the equator, if the Earth rotates on its axis in a day, must move eastward at the rate of 1,250 feet a second, the air would similarly move 1,250 feet westward in a second, which would more than 10 times surpass the velocity of the most her fearful hurricane. We cannot perceive the rotation of the Earth in any way. We cannot demonstrate it. There are no air currents which we can justly regard as, or even supposed to be, consequences of this rotation. These facts ought to be proof enough against the existence of a rotation of the Earth. Must it not appear almost absurd in us, preoccupied by what they have taught us in school, to accept a theory of the rotation of the earth which neither is nor can be proven? Must we not wonder at the readiness of the learned of nearly the entire world from the time of Copernicus and Kepler to accept the conception of the rotation of the earth and then search afterwards now for nearly three and a half centuries for arguments to maintain it, but of course without being able to find them? Exhibit 17, Snipers. Some may quickly counter that snipers account for the rotation of the Earth. The claim is nonsense, and many military professionals have declared the same. But more importantly, you can go online and read the actual sniper manuals for the Army Special Forces Sniper Training, Army Sniper Training, U.S. Navy SEAL Sniper Training, U.S. Army Special Operations, and the Marines. Despite popular belief, there is no sniper adjustment for the purported Coriolis effect, Again, a huge proof of the stationary Earth and more proof that popular media has lied to us. Exhibit 18, the Antarctic Treaty. The Antarctic Treaty is an important proof of the Flat Earth because it evinces an intentional and multinational effort to prevent people from determining what's beyond the 60th South Parallel and Antarctica. In short, independent travel is not allowed or outside of the 60th South Parallel, and that hides the Flat Earth. Under the general concept of the Flat Earth, Antarctica is the likely shoreline of the world's oceans. North is in the middle, south is in every direction towards the outside of the circle. You can see that here on this Flat Earth map from 1587 from Urbano Monti and this 1892 Gleason map, both of which came out long before the Antarctic Treaty. Because of this, Antarctica is the one area that would prove the Flat Earth model correct. Coincidentally, yeah right, coincidentally, no independent travel is allowed below the 60th South Parallel. This isn't a theory, it is a well-established fact. The Antarctic Treaty, its handbook, and its enforcement protocols, which have remained inviolate for 60 years, and include signatories like the US, North Korea, China, and the former Soviet Union, essentially ban any reasonable attempt to explore below the 60th South Parallel under the guise of protecting the environment. Think of what has happened in the last 60 years. The Antarctic Treaty survived Vietnam and all of the Cold War despite the claim that Antarctica is rich in minerals including coal, oil, and uranium. Were the Soviets really that interested in protecting penguins and the environment? I think the Romanian people would have a hard time believing that about the Soviet Union. It's ludicrous. 
Yes, Romania ratified the Antarctic Treaty on September 15, 1971. Don't your alarm bells go off when you hear that this huge swath of land, which is also the highest continent in the world, is off limits to independent exploration by people like you and I? Yes, they will claim you can independently go, but they are lying. The amount of red tape and other intentional restrictions that you would have to jump through is impracticable, and they know it, and the borders of Antarctica are patrolled by all signatory nations. Of course, there are token explorations along the ice shelf, and there are a few destination spots that you are not allowed to venture from, but that entire section of the world is off-limits to independent travel. This doesn't happen unless they are hiding something big from us. If you would like to know more on the subject, go and watch this video I made. You can find it on the Globebusters channel. So telling we flat earthers to take a picture of the edge or the dome, if there is any, is a ruse because nobody is allowed to independently travel below the 60th south parallel, and that fact is proof of the flat earth. Exhibit 19, lack of north-south circumnavigation. East-west circumnavigation is very possible on the flat earth, but what isn't possible on the flat earth is north-south circumnavigation. In particular, under the generally accepted flat earth model, it appears as though you can't, for example, fly from the tip of South America, traverse Antarctica, and then make your way up to Australia or South Africa. That would be the shortest route. So guess what doesn't happen in real life? North-South circumnavigation. Below, the 60th South Parallel is completely devoid of all flights, and the vast majority of Southern Hemisphere flights first go to the Northern Hemisphere before traveling back down to the Southern Hemisphere. The routes are a joke. There are a few who claim they have completed a North-South circumnavigation trek, but the claims are ludicrous, most often referring to flights that turn around once they get to Antarctica and full of other fraudulent indices. Hundreds of thousands of flights east-west and only a few highly questionable north-south circumnavigation claims. Come on, alarm bells should be going off because this wouldn't happen on a globe. Exhibit 20, the eclipse. The lunar eclipse is very often raised as the key proof of the globe, but it actually doesn't help the heliocentric cause at all. First, there's the well-documented Selenelian. This is video of one that happened on January 20th, 2019. There's the lunar eclipse above the horizon, and there's the sun above the horizon. A selenelian is where a lunar eclipse occurs when both the sun and the moon are both above the horizon, which means there is no alleged earth between the sun and the moon that could cause a shadow on the moon. That's geometrically impossible, and the official explanation of refraction is ludicrous as it causes a cascade of problems with other actual observations. Next, the shape of the eclipse is wrong. A shadow of a sphere on a sphere does not make a curve like this. You just have to think about it. A curve on a curve is distorted. Third, the color a lunar eclipse produces is reddish. Can you produce a red shadow here on Earth? No, it's impossible. And again, the official explanation regarding sunsets and sunrises on Earth appearing on the moon is shockingly ridiculous. Finally, very often the lunar eclipse comes from the wrong direction, like in this video. Under the official model, the shadow should always come from the bottom and rise up. Instead, you'll often have lunar eclipse shadows come from top to bottom, again belying the globe model. The solar eclipse is a strong proof of the flat Earth. First, notice that the sun and the moon are the same size. That's a statistical impossibility under the globe model. Now look at the size of the shadow. The moon is supposed to have a diameter of 2,159 miles. Then why is the shadow of the moon only 70 miles across during a solar eclipse. These are all proofs that the sun and the moon are much more local than claimed. Exhibit 21, no photos of Earth from space. Another huge proof of the flat Earth is that there are no photos of the Earth from space. Here's the 2002 blue marble image created by Robert Simmons from NASA. It looks real, right? But it's not real, and NASA says so. I can't say this with enough emphasis. This is an admitted fake. A NASA employee wrapped a flat map of the Earth. Let me re repeat that. He wrapped a flat map, not photographs. He wrapped a flat map of the Earth around a cartoon ball and added surfaces, clouds, and oceans to match what people think the Earth looks like. You don't believe me? Well, let's look at this NASA article about Robert Simmon, who created the 2002 blue marble image. Here's the first interesting omission from NASA. The last time any 
one took a photograph from Earth above low Earth orbit that showed an entire hemisphere, one side of a globe, was in 1972 during Apollo 17. Of course, the moon landings were fake, and so the 1972 photograph was fake. You can tell it's a painting when you actually look at it. But this is NASA admitting that there were no photographs of the Earth like this from 1972 until 2015. Without question, all of the so-called pictures of Earth from space for 43 years that you were brought up to believe in were only artist renditions and other fake images from NASA, and that's why NASA always uses the word image instead of photograph. That's pretty alarming. But this is the more interesting omission. Then we wrapped the flat map around a ball. My part was integrating the surface, clouds and oceans to match people's expectations of how the Earth looks from space. That ball became the famous blue marble. Simmon wrapped a flat map created from data, not photographs, around a ball and made up the rest with computer graphics to match people's expectations. Seriously, that's just propaganda. How many posters of this image hang on walls of classrooms across the world? Here, you can buy it on Amazon. Don't you think it should include the warning? This is a purely phony image created by NASA employee Robert Simmon that was fabricated to match your expectations of what you think the Earth looks like. So, maybe a billion people have seen this blue marble image of Earth, believing it's real, when it is composed of a flat map wrapped around a ball with other fakery added. Isn't that disconcerting for the honest, objective, truth seeker? After the admitted 2002 blue marble fakery, NASA claims that they took an actual photograph of the Earth from space in July 2015. That's the first alleged photograph in 43 years. Here it is. Does this alleged 2015 photograph look much different than the admitted fake image of 2002? As we already saw, NASA artists can admittedly create fake images of the Earth that look real to everyone, and that's a fact. Shouldn't you now be a bit skeptical? Instead of spending $340 million on this alleged 2015 photograph, NASA could have just had another NASA employee recreate the 2002 image with a few different clouds and shading, and no one would know the difference, and NASA could pocket the rest. As a different example, if a forger created an admitted fake painting from Van Gogh and sold the perfect but fake Van Gogh for $1,000, that would be fine, right? As long as he's honest about it, I wouldn't have a problem. But then let's say this excellent forger claimed a decade later to have a real Van Gogh on sale for $50 million. Wouldn't you be a tad bit skeptical before purchasing it, especially if you had no way of verifying its authenticity? I would. But let's take a closer look at NASA's supposed 2015 photograph. Let's rotate it and zoom in. The word sex is spelled in the clouds. It's unmistakable. Some pervert at NASA thought that was awesome. This isn't cherry picking one of 10,000 images. This is the first supposed photograph of Earth from space in 43 years, and it just so happens to have sex spelled in the clouds. Come on. It seems like Disney likes to put these types of hidden things to mark its cartoons, like in The Lion King, for example. This was also an interesting quote from Wired Magazine regarding phony space images. Images sure don't come straight out of space telescopes looking press release ready. Each visualization, each visualization, is the result of artists and planetary scientists collaborating to convert blips on a data readout into something that looks like a planet, all while remaining scientifically plausible. In other words, all of those space images you have on your walls are all imaginary constructs to only look plausible. Robert Simmon created Blue Marble to match people's expectations. It sounds like that is the standard NASA policy. It's all propaganda. The next fallback for the Globe supporter will be the Himawari satellite. You know, the satellite the Globe supporters always boast is produ producing thousands of images of the Earth from space. I have to say this again. NASA already stated that it can wrap flat maps around a ball and make it look real. Himawari is just a step up in the software, as now weather radar on top of flat maps is just wrapped around a ball with an added night and day terminator line. 
Paul on the Plane has a great video exposing the fact that Himawari is just that, software that wraps flat weather radar maps onto a ball. That's it. The total lack of so-called pictures of Earth from space only proves that the globe and space are nothing but propaganda. Exhibit 22, The Professionals. So, when I was introduced to the Flat Earth, I immediately thought of the many professionals who would need to deal with the curvature of the Earth as part of their career. You know, snipers, surveyors, pilots, civil engineers, military guys, that kind of thing. We already talked about snipers, but the truth is that none of these professionals account for the curvature. There are many interviews now with airline pilots, military professionals, radar operators, missile operators, engineers, commercial surveyors, and many more, all stating that there is no accounting for the curvature or the Earth's rotation in any manner, not one bit. That's amazing, isn't it? So what proof do we have that we live on a rotating ball other than just faith and liars? Exhibit 23, The Vacuum of Space. They want you to believe that this Earth and its atmosphere are surrounded by a nearly endless vacuum that's more powerful than any vacuum that can be created here on Earth, and yet this vacuum is so weak that it can't remove our atmosphere. This is a fact. There's simply no possible way that an atmosphere can exist adjacent to a vacuum. Whore vacui. Nature abhors a vacuum. For example, this MIT professor is showing that once you have a gas exposed to a vacuum, that the gas will enter and fill the vacuum, but it's really just common sense. Here's a practical test by Dr. John D., who confirms the same. An atmosphere cannot exist adjacent to a vacuum. And as shown in the test, gravity doesn't fix the problem. You can just place the vacuum on top of the atmosphere, and it doesn't change the outcome as the gas will flow straight up to the vacuum, and this is a minuscule vacuum when compared to the alleged vacuum of space. How do we know the official heliocentric model is false? Because we'd all be dead if it were true. Exhibit 24, High Altitude Balloons. Some of the earliest high-altitude aeronauts confirmed the flat Earth. In 1931, Auguste Picard reached an altitude of 51,775 feet, much higher than any plane you've been on. Picard described the Earth as a flat disk with upturned edge. Around December 1933, Russian aeronauts reached an altitude of 11.8 miles, or 62,304 feet. The article reads, Looking down, they tried in vain to detect any curvature of the Earth's horizon. No, you've never seen the curvature of the Earth from an airplane window. Fortunately, you don't have to be a death-defying aeronaut to see what's up there. What you're seeing right now is a video from 121,000 feet. I remember when I first saw this, I was just dumbfounded because it didn't match anything that I've watched before. Whenever you're shown a picture of a high-altitude balloon or even a high flight, you're shown something phony like this. This isn't once in a while. This is the standard. It turns out that these so-called curvature photos and videos were all shot with a fisheye or ultra-wide angled lens to get this effect. That's a fact. The lens of the camera or the curvature of the window in the airplane is the supposed curvature. It's a curvature illusion. For all of our lives, we're inundated with supposed pictures from space. High-altitude balloons finally gave us a vision of what the Earth truly looks like from high up. Here's a great example of the standard deception. As you can see by the bent rope, the student's photo here was taken with a fisheye lens, and then the article falsely claimed it was the curvature. Do you see the deception? In addition to the flat horizon as shown at 128,000 feet, the Felix Baumgartner jump proves the flat Earth in another way. Here's where Felix entered the dangling capsule at maybe 10 feet. Notice where the horizon line is. Here's Felix at 128,000 feet. The horizon line should have dropped substantially. Instead, the horizon line is at the same exact spot, thus proving that the horizon does indeed rise to eye level, belying the globe model again. Exhibit 25. No space satellites. The common objection to the flat Earth is, what about satellites? Did you know that NASA has hundreds of these satellite balloons up in the air right now? I never knew these NASA satellites existed before flat Earth. Have you seen them? Google and many other companies have fleets of these balloons as well. Look up Project Loon. The fact that NASA and its subsidiaries hardly discuss these so-called satellites was a huge proof for me because it evinces a deliberate effort to conceal the fact that space satellites don't exist, simply because they're not necessary. The whitewash of these balloon satellites is evidence that they are lying about space satellites. These high-altitude balloons can carry 8,000 pounds and include telescopes, radar equipment, communications equipment, internet, etc. 
Here's one that almost killed some people. Also, never mentioned is the fact that almost all of our alleged communications come from undersea cables and cell towers, not supposed satellites in space. Your cable and satellite radio do not come from space. What about the Hubble telescope? This is the Hubble telescope. It's called Sophia. One flat earther was able to get a NASA manager to admit on the phone that the images from Sophia were strangely being used as Hubble's images. Finally, look at these actual NASA videos of satellites. They are manifestly fake. Look at this one that was launched during a space shuttle mission. It's dangling from a wire. Yes, the graphics are getting better, but this one old video alone proves NASA's faking space. But we'll talk about that more tomorrow. There are so many more proofs of the flat Earth that we could discuss. Look up Aries' failure and Michelson Morley's experiments that showing the Earth is stationary. Ask yourself how there is no worldwide change of stars if the Earth is on different sides of the sun every six months, meaning under the official globe model, nighttime is pointed in opposite directions every six months, but there is no actual worldwide change of stars. Look at the moon and ask yourself why are all the craters perpendicular and why there isn't one crater from a meteor that came in at an angle or horizontally creating a chasm. Why do weather patterns and jet streams seem to fit so well on a flat Earth map? Why is there so much more life towards the alleged northern pole but so little life towards the supposed southern pole when there shouldn't be any difference under the globe model? But my question to you is, what are you going to do now? Will you go back to your comfortable conformity like a good dog? Or do you have an unquenchable desire to know the truth? Dave McGowan made this poignant statement. But what if your own eyes and your innate, though suppressed, ability to think critically and independently tell you that what all the institutions of the state insist is true is actually a lie. What do you do then? Do you trust in your own cognitive abilities? Or do you blindly follow authority and pretend as though everything can be explained away? If your worldview will not allow you to believe what you can see with your own eyes, then the problem, it would appear, is with your worldview. So do you change that worldview, or do you live in denial? In closing, I want to answer the question of why the lie. Of course, they may be hiding land and resources from us. Essentially, the globe constitutes a psychological prison to keep we, the cattle, within our imaginary fences and under control. NASA makes $59.7 million a day. That's a day. To deceive us, and so there's certainly a financial motive. But I think the primary reason behind the lie is more spiritual and found in this quote from the publication called Lucifer, the Light Bearer, that was written in 1887. We date from the 1st of January, 1601. This era is called the Era of Man, to distinguish it from the theological epoch that preceded it. In that epoch, the earth was supposed to be flat. The sun was its attendant light revolving about it. Above was heaven, where God ruled supreme over all potentates and power. Below was the kingdom of the dead, hell. So it taught the Bible. Then came the new astronomy. It demonstrated that the earth is a globe revolving about the sun, that there is no up and down in space. Vanished the old heaven, vanished the old hell. The earth became the home of man. And when the modern cosmogony came, the Bible and the church as infallible oracles had to go, for they had taught that regarding the universe, which was shown to be untrue in every particular. The heliocentric model was created to usher in the era of man and remove God and the Bible from all cosmogony. It brought us such nonsense as the Big Bang and evolution. It removed biblical ideas of heaven above and hell below and the salvation of mankind. Instead, you became an insignificant parasite that descended from primordial ooze. The globe lie worked, at least up until now. My brothers and sisters, this is an exciting time as we have a chance to break these chains that enslave us. However, we must set aside our petty differences and join together with all humility before God to bring his truth to humanity. The evil cabal keeps trying to divide us. Please don't let them do that. Please go out and share the truth with everyone as it is left up to us. Thank you for this opportunity to speak here today, and I hope to meet all of you in person. My love to everyone. May the Lord bless you all. Thank you.